Muy buenas tardes todo el mundo. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm your host, Carolina Moreno, and welcome to Build. Chef Aaron Sanchez is known for proudly serving up Latin American flavors and Spanglish as a judge on Fox's hit culinary competition, Master Chef. As the series' 10th season comes to a close, the award-winning chef teamed up with Mexican food brand Cacique to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month with a campaign that's all about being authentico and true to your roots. Let's take a look. My mom taught me how to cook. From her, I learned never to sacrifice on quality, freshness, and authenticity. That's why I love to use Cacique cheeses, creams, and chorizos. With Cacique, I always go auténtico. Woo! Let's give a warm welcome <laughs> to Aaron Sanchez, everyone. <laughs> Chef Aaron. You like that, huh? Yeah. Now, t t tell me that didn't make you hungry. All I right. hope everybody ate an early lunch because I hear you. We got food on here. Absolutely. Um, so tell us a little bit more about this uh, partnership with Cacique and the platform. What's next in Mexican cuisine? Yeah, I mean, we took advantage of Hispanic Heritage Month to sort of get ahead of the curve and really make, I guess, people that are fans of Mexican food aware of what's the, the coming trends. Uh, I think we're always trying to stay ahead of the game uh, by being able to seek out new flavors, new textures, new technique. And a lot of that happens by understanding what's down the road. So one of the things that we predicted is basically the idea of you know plant-based dishes. I think we're going to start seeing more of that uh, popping up in restaurants and, and different mercados and things of that nature. So we have a beautiful little array of some different things here that I think really speak to that. Yeah. Can you describe yeah, some of the dishes sure. that we have here? <clears throat> so here we have a beautiful tamal that we've gone ahead and done it with jackfruit. I don't know if anybody's familiar with jackfruit. Um, you know, I know how finicky you millennials can get <laughs> when it comes to eating meat and all your dietary restrictions. So this one is basically taking the idea of carnitas, and which is that beautiful, authentic dish that hails from the state of Michoacan, and taking those flavors but utilizing jackfruit as the as the filling, right. and as sort of the 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 the, the, the center or the, the big part of this. And then you just kind of finish it a little bit with some queso fresco. Now queso fresco is the number one cheese that's consumed in Mexico. And of course, Cacique has been on the forefront of that for over four decades, uh, which is just amazing. They're still a family-owned company. They still have a lot of say in what happens, and they share the same standards that I do. That's amazing. And then here, really quickly, this might come as a little bit of a shock value to some of you, but this is a salsa that's made with champulines. I was going to say. With grasshoppers. A chapulín colorado. Okay. Yeah, there you go, exactly. <laughs> uh, so it just has roasted tomatillo, cilantro, some chile, and then, of course, some beautiful toasted grasshoppers from Mexico. Yeah. So don't sound surprised because oh, no. you've probably eaten grasshoppers and some of those little, uh, some of those things that you eat. Like if you had a veggie burger, chances are there's been some grasshopper up in there. It's a great protein. Yeah, it is yeah. a great protein. And then we have some tostadas there with some beautiful mushroom, whipped queso fresco, and some crema. Yeah, so easy stuff. Yeah, and for people who might be surprised about the grasshopper in Mexico, they, they mean, there's bins of it, it's chile, limon, yep. eat them whole as a snack, toasted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we garnish them at the restaurants with on guacamole. We make cocktails awesome. with them, so, yeah. Awesome. So tell us a little, I mean, one of the things that I love about you is that you always have that Mexican attitude, regardless yeah. of if it's Hispanic Heritage Month or not, but obviously this comes at a great time. Mexico's Independence Day was actually this Monday, too. Um, so all, all of great opportunity. And yes, it's not Cinco de Mayo, guys. It's September 16th. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you bring such a wonderful attitude in embracing your roots and everything that you do. One of the things that you do is you have a scholarship fund yep. um, for, for Latino chefs, to empower Latino mm -hmm. chefs. And you also have a memoir coming out. Um, mm -hmm. Lessons, where I come from, life lessons from a Latino chef. Yeah. So tell us about why those two projects are so important for you and your mission to diversify uh, Latino leadership in the in food industry? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, initially when I started cooking 25 years ago, you know, it was very challenging for Latinos to get any kind of executive positions in kitchens. Mm. We were relegated to prep cooks, dishwashers, et cetera, even if you were lucky to be a cook. So now I didn't want education to be a crutch or an obstacle for Latinos to reach their goals of owning their own restaurants, being executive, and positions of leadership. So the Aron Sanchez Scholarship basically identifies young youth between, you know, 18 to 24 um, to be able to sort of pursue their dreams. So they get a full ride to the ICC, which is down the street from here, and they go for 10 months, everything's paid for, and then the idea is that they 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 work within my network of peers and chefs that I know, and they kind of go they go down this journey, 
Uh, so it's really enriching. You've never met a more generous person than a chef. Uh, so we're always giving our time. Um, and then the book, uh, where I come from, is a really, a very poignant tale that sort of tells, you know, my story and how I come from the border and how I came to New York City to chase my dreams of being a chef. And then also it really sort of tells in a very candid way, um, you know, my bouts with anxiety and depression and uncertainty and, you know, being exposed to a lot of, you know, you know, the alcohol, the party and all that stuff that was very prevalent when I started cooking. So, and it's meant to be a cautionary tale, but an inspirational one as well. So it really also catalogs like sort of the inception of the celebrity chef and how that came to be. Um, you know, people wondered, you know, how, does, how you catapult to this level and the book really talks about the early days. I think it, it's important to know that, you know, lessons from a Latino chef. I think that's something that you it's, there's an emphasis there. Is it something because maybe you didn't see those stories when you were starting out of like sort of these success stories or, you know, obviously with ups and downs, but um, sort of kind of see yourself in the, in the place where you want to be, you want to end up? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I guess a lot of the success stories growing up Latino, you hear from your grandparents or your parents and you learn all those inspirational tales at home. And I wanted to make sure that this was something that was open, not just to Latinos, but to everyone to sort of get behind and, 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 and embrace. And um, I'm, we're really poised to make a big, a big splash, I think. This book is really going to touch a lot of people. And I think you're going to be able to identify a lot with it. Yeah. You know? And legacy, your, your family legacy in, in the industry is huge for you. Um, you know, your mom was such a big uh, influence for you, too, as a restaurateur and somebody who made such a splash in the New York City um, food scene. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that all, we'll, we'll also see in the book, kind of your connection with her? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm so blessed because, I, you know, my co-writer is a, a very talented young lady, Emmy Award winning producer, author named Steph Ferrari. And women feature so prominently in my life. Um, and because of my mom, I wanted a female co-writer to do this with me so it can really bring to light all these very powerful women that have influenced me so much in my life. And, you know, you know, the, the book tells, you know, about all my days of, you know, <laughs> free love and <laughs> chasing, you know, chasing women, you know, and doing all that. I'm very explicit with, with everything in the book. And, I, you know, I just wanted to keep it real, you know what I mean? So... Yeah, I, my mom has always been that, that huge source of inspiration. I, I kind of liken her story to like the Tina Turner mm -hmm. kind of story where she just was out of a messy divorce, wanted her children in her name. And she always said she wanted to see her name in lights. And she made it happen. That's beautiful. Yeah. And it's so important to when you talk about diversifying the, the industry industry and leadership, you know, to, to put women sort of front and center because we, we don't see that many um, in the industry. So is that something also that it's important to you? Absolutely. Um, I tried to have my kitchens 50-50 with women um, and, 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 and definitely in the front of the house. I just like it because I, I don't I hate all that machismo bull BS mm -hmm. and when you have women in kitchens, it, it really helps to curtail that and, and, and stop that. So I really, I really go after that. Um, you know, I have six recipients that are scholarship, um, you know, winners, and three of them are going to be women. Three are women. So I have it split right down the middle, and that's that's, that's extremely important to me. That's amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, I love that we're talking about embracing our roots, embracing our communities. Um, but, you know, I think it, it's really important to also know that right now it's a really tough time for Latinos. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of Latinos who don't feel like embracing their roots, who don't feel comfortable speaking in Spanish in public anymore um, because of the negative rhetoric towards our community. Also, uh, tragedies like El Paso, which I know some, is something that is very dear to your heart. You are from El Paso. Um, we were just there, actually. We just did a fundraiser and we raised over... What was it, Kate? About fifty thousand dollars, somewhere close to that, for the victims that were affected. That's amazing. In the so you know, I, I mobilized all of our people, and we went down there and we cooked, and it was something that was really special. Oh my God, that deserves a round of applause, guys. Come Thank on. you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, again, we don't we don't do it for the accolades. We do it because it's it's the right thing to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, whether it's a hurricane that hits the southeast, I live in New Orleans, mm -hmm. so if it's something that hits us, we're gonna. What we know how to do is feed people and make them happy. And food is such love, right? Nurturing. You're, oh, absolutely. Yeah. You were yeah. talking about how chefs are so giving, and I think it's because food in itself is very nurturing. Yeah, you know, and you you look at the story of Casica and how much they've they've really dedicated themselves to that. You know, everything from 
the traditional queso frescos and the cremas, but then you also look at what they're doing now for like things like, uh, you know, uh, tailgating. We have these beautiful prepared uh, queso dips that mm -hmm. that we're really excited about launching. Fully cooked chorizo that you can interweave into any kind of any kind of gathering. So we're well we're well on our way, kind of navigating these new worlds with the authentic flavors. Yeah, and family seems to be something that really is important to you. I think it's important for you that this is a family owned business as well. Absolutely, yeah. Is that something that you plan to pass on as well? I know you have. Yeah, I have an eight-year-old son, <laughs> and uh, his name is Yuma, and he's very funny and, and, and rambunctious, and yeah, uh, his mama's a singer, like plays rock and roll, so, you know, and I'm a chef, so he has to be a little rock and roll kid, but he loves to draw, he loves art, and I, I don't want to push him into being a chef. That's the one thing I told him, I said, you got to go to college, do what I didn't do, and hopefully not be a chef. Uh, hopefully ha know enough to feed himself. <laughs> yeah. No More doubt. than pasta. And yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, well, before we take it to the audience, I want to talk to you about Master Chef, mm -hmm. which the season 10, biggest season ever, which is, you know, we've heard it all season, and it ends tonight yep. um, with a two-hour finale. One of the things I want to say, though, is that one of the things I love about seeing you on Master Chef, and you joined as a permanent judge yeah. two seasons ago. Mm. One of the things I love about being there, having you be there, is the Spanglish. You, mm. you know, you're always throwing out the mijos. You're always kind of saying, you know, adios. And also, everybody pronounces your name correctly. Yeah. Not Aaron. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't. And yeah. I was like shocked. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not to be difficult. You know, my mama calls me Aaron, so I have to go by that name. I'm not like one of those knuckleheads that's named Michael that wants to be called Michelle, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it's just the way the way my name is pronounced. And you know what? I'm bringing that flavor to MasterChef. And incidentally, I just want to let everybody know that we're casting now, October 26th here in New York City, I believe. And you go to MasterChefCasting.com. And if you want to chase your dreams, being a chef, you can do it. So I encourage everyone to go apply. It starts in the MasterChef kitchen. Orale. I'm <laughs> down with it. But, you know, it's it, it's amazing because I struggle, too. I mean, everybody's always called me Carolina, Carolyn, Car you know, all those things. And it, it really is important, you know, for you to have your own name. Um, was it something that you struggled with, sort of kind of making sure that that authenticity stayed throughout your career? Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't, you know, Spanish is my first language. I speak it more probably than I speak English just because, you know, I encourage a lot of second-generation Latinos. I'm like... The way you keep up with it is have friends that speak Spanish mm -hmm. and call them and speak in that language. You know, I have 10 friends that I just call and we only speak Spanish. I call my mom, we only speak Spanish. So if, you, if you're if you worried about holding on to it, surround yourself around people that are in touch with the culture. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a saying, you know, cuando pierdes tu lengua, pierdes tu patria. When you lose your tongue, you lose your country. So you really got to keep up with that. That's where I would tell somebody if they want to really hold on to their Latino roots, you know, continue to speak. Yeah, don't be silenced. Yeah, and anything. that's why I'm teaching my son, because I don't want him to go to Mexico, visit with his cousins and his nephews and everything, and then feel, feel left out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And again, the, the season finale is tonight. Yes. You, you've been, you know, raising the stakes. You guys just, you know, had, well, air, it aired the London, yep. a couple of London episodes. You guys had a wedding in the Master Chef kitchen. Yeah. Um, what is to be expected tonight? Oh, man. Fireworks, fireworks. I think what we've gone ahead and done is we've chosen the finalists based on how diverse this wonderful country is, how many, how many people are able, how many of these home cooks are able to be great students and learn and evolve through the process of MasterChef. It's not like regular cooking competition shows where we just kind of kick them off mm -hmm. and they don't get anything out of it. Regardless if you win, lose, you still come out with this mentoring and these techniques and skills that you've learned. So expect fireworks. All right. And one of the things that I love about um, the this season is there's so much support and love. Like I, I saw contestants tearing up when other contestants left. Every time somebody, you know, got their, uh, you know, plate just destroyed, you know, there was hugs and there was just like chin up, a lot of those things. Is that sort of the same vibe you get back behind the scenes backstage? Yeah, I mean, sh yeah. To be really honest, I wish they were a little bit more cutthroat. You know what I mean? Because this is a competition. Like, I'm all down with Kumbaya and all that stuff. But, like, you know, if I were going against Joe and Gordon, I would go for their throat. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I would, when I get in that mode to compete, and I've competed a lot, you know, I've been on Iron Chef, I've cooked next Iron Chef, I've done it all. But when I compete, I'm going to win. And 
So they were very friendly, this particular group. <laughs> they weren't as catty as other times past. I was going to say, I was yeah. like, wow, like, this group is just so loving. There's so much support. They're hugging each other, rooting each other on from the balcony. Yeah, it's like, come on, this will be okay. <laughs> but you know what I've seen actually behind the scenes, which is very unique to this particular season? They all go out together. Like, they're going ahead and have their own little brands now, and they're doing MasterChef contestant dinners around the country. And it's just really nice to see that they're using the platform for good. Mm-hmm. And, and chasing their dreams. It really, a master chef family. We, you know, you guys Absolutely. always have people coming back. Yep. You guys had a wedding this season. So, is it? I'm sure it's. It, you you kind of you have to be impartial as a judge, but you maybe get attached a little bit to some of these stories at least, like these people's you know future and their mm-hmm. love and their dreams. It, yeah. You know, it, is it is it kind of hard not to get attached, or you, do you follow along with them after they leave? Yeah, no, I'm actually very cold-blooded. I don't have any feelings at cool, all. Cool, 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 cool. No, uh, <laughs> no, of course. I mean, I'm human, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm very much more very much more tender when it comes to the children because I judge that that style as well. But, yeah, you know, I try to be indifferent. I judge the food. I don't judge the person. Yeah. That's the only way to keep it fair. You know what I mean? If everybody had a sad story, you know what I mean, and I fell for that, then sadly they'd be winning instead of their food. Right. You know what I mean? Can I ask you a question? So sure. this is a curiosity for me. When you guys go to test, how do you, how do you, what you guys look at the at the actual look at it and then put it in? Your, what are you guys looking for there? Are you just looking to make sure everything's cooked properly, making sure there's nothing like a string in there? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, it depends on what the situation is. But if, if you know, if they have to recreate a dish or they have to, they have to do something that's inspired by a particular ingredient or style of cooking, we have to make sure that they stay true to that. Mm -hmm. And then we're just looking for presentation. We want to make sure it looks attractive. And most importantly is we want to see the evolution. We want to see their growth. We don't want, you know, week one to look like week 10's dish. We need to see a vast improvement. So that gives us faith in selecting the right people to move on or go home. Mm -hmm. So we want to see growth. And then obviously evolution of taste and flavor. And this is the biggest season ever. So, you know, what, what can come next possibly? Man, well, you know, I think we've established that we can all travel uh, and get along. I think that's a good thing. So who knows? Maybe we might go to Mexico this year. I was going to say. And then I'll bring I'll bring them down there, and I'll be the guide. I'll be the Gordon for England. You know what I mean? That's amazing. So we'll bring it down, and, and that way Gordon can maybe be a little bit quiet once in a while, and I can <laughs> he can listen to me. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. But and we can have some chapulines in a mystery box. I hope so. We That'd can do a little great. chapulines. We can do we can do just, we can do a lot no, of things. I know. There's so much to do. Oaxaca. Oaxaca. Oaxaca yeah. would be wonderful. I love it. Well, we have some, uh, you know, audience questions, and I want to take it there. Um. Great. Hi. Um, So you spoke a little bit about the balance of both serving as a chef and as a larger public voice as a TV personality. Mm. Uh, And I was just wondering, how do you kind of maintain, like, a personal passion uh, as a cook and as a chef while it plays such a central role in your life? That's a great, uh, great, great question. I think initially I started doing television as a as a way of getting people into the door in my restaurants. I used it as a marketing tool. My dream was always to have my own restaurant. That's what I wanted to do, hands down. And then when I started doing television, the message became bigger. Imagine pe- somebody like in Sioux Falls, Iowa, that doesn't have a Latino neighborhood in their city and doesn't know how to work with these techniques and flavors. Television transmits that message really quickly and makes an impact. So when you use television for the right reasons, it really does make a difference in a beautiful way. I try to always make sure I'm a chef first, TV personality second, and all the other things I do. But the food is the most important. So I try to, when I'm home, I'm always cooking. I'm in the restaurants. I'm developing new dishes, inspiring the cooks. Like That's what I love to do and what I'm good at. Great. We have one more question. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to know if you ever get influences outside of the culinary world that end up influencing your food. Absolutely. Um, I'll give you an example for, for, you know, this year for my book launch, I'm going on a Texas tour with a dear friend of mine named Shaky Graves. He's a fantastic musician. I hope you, if you guys look up his music. So he and I are going to be doing a Q&A. He's going to do a quick little set, an hour set. I'm going to serve people. We're going to go to these iconic theaters all over Texas, and we're going to sort of have him influence me and inspire me through his music, and I'm going to do the same with food. So that's a really good example of how I'm embracing the musical part and the other facets of art. Yeah. So wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So where I come from, Life Lessons from a Latino Chef memoir out October 1st. Mm-hmm. 
Um, if you want more information about the platform, you can go to caciqueinc.com. Mm -hmm. And the two-hour season finale of MasterChef Season 10 airs tonight at 8 p.m. on Fox. Yep, and don't forget to cast. Don't if you want to get on the show, October 26th, masterchefcasting.com. Amazing. Thank, Thank you so much for having me. Carolina. Thank you Guapa. so much, Aaron. <laughs> Muchísimas gracias. Thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.